the Sahara, an endless sea of sand and boiling rocks. Dangerous and beautiful at the same time. Tuareg country. And in between, islands of life, suffering from the drought, but surviving. A strong demonstration of life's extreme adaptability. Sandstorms are a frequent companion in the Sahara and have names like Ghibli or Harmattan, depending on which direction they're coming from. The sand originates from the rocks that underlie the Sahara. In a few places, these rocks come to the surface where endless winds, extreme temperature changes and the odd rain shower attack them and degrade them down to dust and sand. North Africa is a key region for oil and gas exploration and production. In this film, we'll take you through some of the aspects of an important Paleozoic petroleum system in the core of the Sahara. The case study presented may also serve as an analogue for other parts of North Africa and Arabia where similar petroleum plays exist. We want to take you now to southwest Libya to explore the Ordovician and Silurian rocks that were formed more than 430 million years ago. <laughs> Libya is located in central North Africa. Huge parts of the country are dominated by the Saharan Desert. In southern Libya, two large circular structures stick out of the ground that mark the margins of old Paleozoic sag basins, the Kufra Basin in southeast Libya and the Murzuk Basin in the southwestern part of the country. The two are separated by the Tibesti High. The Kufra and Murzuk Basins are part of a basin network that covers large parts of North Africa. In Algeria, Morocco, Mauritania and other countries, similar Paleozoic basins are developed. For example, the Gadamis and Elysi basins. It's striking how similar the two basins are, in fact. The Cambro-Ordovician, red, and Silurian, green, are buried up to four kilometers deep in the basin centers. Along the Tibesti Highland and other basin margins, the Paleozoic rocks come to the surface where they've been deeply eroded. During the early Paleozoic, the Kufra and Murzuk basins had not yet formed. A large shelf sea covered most of North Africa at the time instead. Despite the inhospitable desert conditions, groups of technicians and geologists have traveled to southern Libya for more than 65 years, drilling thousands of holes into the ground because hidden underneath the desert sands are two precious resources without which our modern society cannot exist. The first one is water. Underground the Sahara, 
huge water reservoirs have been discovered that form the lifeline for the green oases and also several agricultural projects scattered in the Saharan desert. The water reserves are so large that every day two million cubic meters of water are pumped to the more densely populated north of Libya. The pipeline network measures several thousands of kilometers, the diameter of four meters. Truly a great man-made river, as it's been officially termed. However, with every drop extracted from the subterranean reservoirs, water reserves shrink irreversibly because the Saharan water is so-called fossil groundwater. This water formed more than 10,000 years ago during a time when northern Europe was covered deeply under glacial ice masses. The Sahara then was a humid savanna exposed to frequent rainfall supporting a rich flora and fauna. Lakes scattered the region and the scenery must have been similar to present-day East Africa. Climatic belts were shifted by thousands of kilometers. Around the same time, prehistoric humans lived in the area and hunted for big games such as lions, elephants, rhinos and hippopotamus. Wildlife and hunting scenes are captured in artistic rock carvings and paintings that are still preserved in Saharan cliffs and caves today. The other precious Saharan resource is oil and gas. Perpetual fires burn unwanted gas and form prominent landmarks around the producing petroleum fields. In the middle of nowhere, luxurious villages with swimming pools sourced by the fossil groundwater have been built. They're a second home for the oil personnel, working for many weeks far away from their families. Our expedition takes us to the western margin of the Murzuk Basin in southwest Libya. The region is dominated by a 300 km long north-south running wadi, the Wadi Tanazuft. The central wadi area has been excavated by rivers and wind because its underlying Silurian shales are soft and therefore easy to destroy and remove. The strata are tilted to the east towards the basin center, so that stratigraphic ages at outcrop become younger into this direction. Cambrian and Ordovician sandstones occur on the western side of Wadi Tanazuft and form a hilly landscape. To the east, the wadi ends with a towering cliff face of the Akakos Mountains. It's formed by hard sandstones of Silurian and early Devonian age. The biggest community in the region is the city of Ghat. The town was first mentioned by the Arabic writer Ibn Battutus in the 14th century and used to be an important post in the Trans-Saharan caravan trade. Prehistoric graveyards and rock carvings show, however, that human settlements must have existed already much earlier in the Ghat region. Strangely, the building blocks of the old town were not simply taken from the abundant Paleozoic sandstones that can be found around Ghat but were made from the oasis soil that was mixed with water to form a mud. The mixture was then poured into a cast and dried in the sun. Such bricks form the basis of many Saharan oasis towns. Today, the inhabitants have left the old traditional quarters and moved to modern houses. Overlooking Dart is Fort Kukumen, last used by the Italian army against French attackers during World War II. The fort was built on late Ordovician sandstones formed during a major glaciation that also affected large parts of the Sahara. During the late Ordovician, Africa, as part of Gondwana, was located over the South Pole. For a brief period of probably only 200,000 years, a large ice cap developed similar to the present-day Antarctic ice shield. 
In North Africa, typical glacial deposits formed during this time. Among these are diamictites, poorly sorted rocks with coarse clasts in a fine-grained matrix. Glacial striations may have formed by ice scraping over the sediment surface. More likely, however, is sediment internal shearing on multiple horizons caused by ice loading. Under the ice, deep tunnel valleys developed. Today, these can be studied on seismic lines and in outcrops, as in this example from the Algerian Tassili. A forest in the desert, a very rocky one. Pillars made of glacial Ordovician sandstone form an amazing landscape on the western side of the Wadi Tanazuft. The rock unit is called Mamuniyat sandstone and similar strata can be found across most of North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. Every day temperatures in the Sahara vary dramatically, with burning heat during the day and nights where the air in winter cools down to below freezing point. Drastic temperature changes like these, plus wind and the occasional rain, are the erosional sculptures of the lively Mamuniyat landscape. Sets of fractures standing perpendicular to each other form the borders of the pillars. Without them, the sandstones would just be monotonous hills. The late Ordovician pillars have been admired by generations of geologists and decorate the corridor walls of the Industrial Research Center, the Libyan Authority for Geological Mapping. The glacial Mamuniyat sandstone is an important hydrocarbon reservoir unit in the Murzuk Basin and also in several other oil and gas provinces across North Africa and Arabia. However, the lateral distribution of this unit is discontinuous and reservoir quality changes greatly over just a few kilometers. Overlying the Ordovician glacial sands are shales of Silurian age that form the central parts of Wadi Tanazuft. The Silurian shales were named Tanizuft shales after the wadi where they are best exposed. The basal part of the shale unit is very soft and the contact with the underlying Ordovician is only exposed in a few places in the region. Interbedded with the shales are thin silt and sandstone beds in which ripples and hummocky crossbeds occur. Originating from nearshore areas, the silts and sands were transported onto the muddy shelf by storm events and turbidities. The Silurian shales were deposited when the polar ice caps began to melt towards the end of the late Ordovician glaciation. The meltwater influx resulted in a global sea level rise of about 100 meters, similar to the last ice age some 12,000 years ago. As a result, the paleo depressions of the Ordovician glacial relief were soon flooded. On a Gondwana scale, the dimensions of the early Silurian transgression become clear. In several regions, the shorelines were pushed thousands of kilometers inland. Gravel and sands coming from the huge Gondwanan hinterland were trapped in the coastal belts, leaving only fine mud particles to settle down in the wide shelfful seas. Initially, only the deepest parts of the North African shelf were flooded during the early Silurian transgression. Islands still existed during this time where erosional processes dominated. Around the island's belts, shallow marine conditions were developed in which waves and currents only allowed deposition of sandstones that today are hard to distinguish from the underlying late Ordovician sandstones. In the basinal areas of the shelf, clean, organic-rich shales were deposited here shown in red. Their distribution is discontinuous and restricted to the paleo-low areas of the shelf. When fresh and unweathered, these shales are pitch black, at least when the outer drilling mud layer from the core is removed. This core was cut in an exploration well in the Murzuk Basin. In oil exploration terminology, this black shale is also known as the hot shale. The unit rarely exceeds the thickness of 25 meters. It represents the most important Paleozoic source rock for oil and gas 
in North Africa and Arabia. Pyrite, typical for reducing conditions, occurs both as flat-based centimeter scale lumps and in much smaller so-called framboidal form. The individual framboids are only around 5 micrometers in diameter and consist of a great number of even smaller pyrite crystals. The exact reasons behind the deposition of the Silurian hot shales in northern Gondwana are still largely unclear. An important element in this ecological puzzle might have been the uneven relief left behind by the late Ordovician glacial processes. Islands and swells served as efficient flow barriers, hampering water circulation and hence oxygen resupply on the shelf. A second important element might have been the unusually fast and intense post-glacial transgression during the early Silurian. Throughout Earth history, transgressions frequently coincide with times of poorly oxygenated shelf seas, probably because they lead to deposition of very clean shales, preventing contamination with gravels and sands which are trapped in the river mouths during these times. A third element that might explain the formation of the earliest Silurian anoxia is the fresh water coming from the melting polar ice caps. This meltwater might have formed a light water mass that overlay marine shelf waters as a cap, preventing mixing and therefore oxygen resupply to the deeper layers. Finally, upwelling activity and high productivity conditions along the North African shore might have played a role in the formation of the Silurian black shales. Large amounts of nutrients might have drifted from the upwelling zones onto the North African shelf. This could have led to eutrophication, an excess supply of organic matter that could not be oxidized with the oxygen available in the water column. Towards the end of the early Landovery, the anoxic event and therefore hot shale deposition was terminated. Sea level was still rising. Circulation and oxygen supply were increasing. The shales turned green and lacked any organic matter. Silurian cold shales. Up to 500 meters of this strata were deposited during the early Silurian in southwest Libya. The Silurian is subdivided into the four series Landovery, Wenlock, Ludlow and Priddley. Deposition of the Silurian lower hot shale in northern Gondwana was restricted to a short episode of only 200,000 years during the early Landovery, the Rudanian. Precise dating of these events is only possible because hemichordate animals of between 1 and 10 centimeters once roamed the Silurian seas and changed their structure frequently during their evolution every few hundred thousands of years, the graptolites. As we know the precise ages of the various graptolite forms, we can age date all Silurian rock layers that contain graptolites. In Wadi Tanazuft, we find these fossil clocks in several Silurian shale horizons, although it sometimes takes a while to discover these bugs. The graptolites provide us with a detailed time frame which is needed to unravel the history of the Silurian hot shale in Libya and the rest of northern Gondwana. In 1998, graptolites from a Silurian hot shale core confirmed the early Landovery age of the unit in the Murzuk Basin. Similar ages for the Silurian hot shale have been previously reported from places like Saudi Arabia, Jordan and Morocco. The term hot shale was introduced from the Silurian black shales based on their high natural gamma radiation in well logs. In the Murzuk Basin, values on the API scale may reach 600 and more, while values of the cold shale commonly range between only 90 and 120 API. The high gamma ray readings are entirely due to an enrichment in uranium. Concentration curves of the other two main radioactive elements, thorium and potassium, do not show major changes over the hot shale because these elements are clearly restricted to the detrital fraction here. The enrichment in uranium is related to a redox change during deposition of the hot shale. Under oxygenated conditions, U6 plus is dissolved in seawater. 
Under anoxic black shale forming conditions, however, U6 plus is reduced to U4 plus, which is unsoluble and therefore precipitated. Elevated concentrations of orthogenic uranium in the Silurian hot shale therefore generally coincide with high organic richness. In addition, it can be demonstrated that a fully quantitative relationship exists in which greater uranium concentrations are matched by higher concentrations in organic matter. As an application, the total organic carbon content of the Silurian hot shale can be efficiently approximated in the subsurface based on gamma ray response. A thorough calibration has to be carried out to employ this technique successfully. For this purpose, gamma ray and TOC data pairs are cross-plotted and the correlation line calculated. The gradient of this correlation line will vary, in particular for shales with different thermal maturities. Increased thermal maturity also means that significant amounts of organic matter have been turned into hydrocarbons. These have then migrated out of the source rock into rocks of higher permeability, leaving behind a source rock with reduced total organic carbon content. This and other effects have to be taken into account in the calibration. Using the gamma ray curves of the well logs, the distribution, thickness and organic richness of the hot shale can be reconstructed for the subsurface of the Moorzuk Basin. It soon became clear that the distribution of the hot shale, here in red, is laterally discontinuous, patchy. Large parts of the Moorzak Basin appear to have been paleo-high areas that were not flooded by the sea during the Rudanian anoxic event. On a North Africa-wide scale, the Silurian hot shale is best developed in Algeria and becomes more patchy towards east and west. Whilst the distribution of the Silurian hot shale is now well known for the intensely explored central parts of the Moorzak Basin, little information is available for those areas where no or only few wells have been drilled in the past. Such poorly understood regions are, for example, the extreme western and eastern parts of the Moorzuk Basin. Mapping of the Silurian hot shales in surface exposures along the basin margins is a cost-effective method to reduce the source availability risk for these areas. Identification of the hot shale at outcrop, however, has never been achieved in the past. This is mainly because all Silurian shales at outcrop are green, red and grey. Black coloured shales are completely absent because desert weathering has altered the original rock colours. Furthermore, identification of the hot shale at outcrop by geochemical methods is also impossible because the same weathering processes have commonly also destroyed all organic matter that may have been originally deposited in the shales. However, recent field tests have now shown that the typical uranium enrichment of the Silurian hot shale remains largely unaltered by weathering in surface exposures. This turns out to be an important discovery, as it allows the identification of the hot shale in the field using a portable gamma-ray spectrometer which measures the uranium concentrations of the shales directly at outcrop. Uranium values of greater than 10 parts per million indicate a significant enrichment and are taken as evidence for the hot shale being present. The first section studied lies only three kilometers southwest of Gart. Here, the Silurian shales are directly underlain by a latest Ordovician fine-grained unit and the late Ordovician green Melez Shukran formation. The Mamuniet sandstone has not been deposited here. The uranium concentrations of the Silurian shales are high and reach values of up to 50 parts per million. The hot shale has also been identified 10 kilometers north of Gut. Uranium concentrations here, however, do not exceed 18 parts per million.
10 kilometers south of Ghat, a section has been studied at the eastern side of the wadi. Only traces of the hot shale were found with only one horizon, slightly exceeding the 10 parts per million uranium cutoff. The contact between Ordovician Mamuniate sandstone and Tanazuft shale is clearly exposed in this area. The next section is located in the extreme north of Wadi Tanazuft. Located near the northern tip of the dark Akakos Mountains, it takes a while to reach this section, starting from Ghat. Moving northwards, the Silurian Akakos sands form a highly dissected mountainous range. Prehistoric rock carvings are common and testify to a wetter climate in the Pleistocene. An uncrossable high escarpment bounds the Akakos Mountains to the west. Our road runs in Wadi Tanazuft, where fossil groundwater is used in agricultural projects. The underlying Tanazuft shales are the basis for fertile soils. Our journey continues due north. Soon a sand dune network appears to the left, the nasty one we just about managed to escape from in the beginning of this film. On this satellite image, the dark, rugged Akakos sands can be easily distinguished from the Ordovician, which has a distinctly smoother appearance and appear in light red. We arrive at the section. Here, the gamma ray spectrometer did not detect any enrichment in uranium. During the earliest Silurian transgression, this particular area must have been a paleo high. The Silurian hot shale has therefore not been deposited here. We stay in the north and look at a final section. Some 50 kilometers to the southwest of the previous locality, the hot shale is again fully developed. Enrichment in uranium is strong with up to 50 parts per million and the hot shale is at least 12 meters thick. This is also the only studied section where the shales were dark gray. However, weathering is intense here as in all other sections. All in all, the hot shale was absent in two of the seven sections studied. Maximum uranium concentrations and overall thicknesses of the hot shale in the remaining five sections was highly variable. The depositional model allows for such variabilities. The model cannot predict presence or absence of the hot shale in a particular area, but it gives a general framework for distribution patterns and scales. It also shows that large distance interpolations of source rock distribution data is potentially dangerous, in particular if only few real data points exist in a certain region. The presence of Silurian hot shale along the western margin of the Murzuk Basin also suggests that this margin and in fact the Murzuk Basin had not formed by early Silurian times, otherwise the whole Wadi Tanazuft would have been a largely paleo-high lacking any hot shale development. Comparison of the hot shale distribution in the Ghat outcrop belt with the subsurface distribution shows that similar variabilities exist in both areas. The presence of the hot shale over larger parts of the Ghat outcrop reduces the source distribution risk for the new westernmost concessions in the Murzuk Basin significantly. The Paleozoic geology in the two southern Libyan basins is remarkably similar. Based on this analog study in Wadi Tanazuft, similar investigations could help to shed new light on the source rock issue in less well-known areas. Following deposition of the lower hot shale and the lowermost part of the cold shale, deltaic sands began to prograde across the North African shelf towards northwest. After the sands had overrun the Murzuk Basin, a second anoxic event occurred. Deposition of the so-called upper hot shale was restricted to the muddy offshore parts of the shelf. Such conditions existed, for example, in the Gadamis Basin, but not in the more proximal Murzuk. This second anoxic event can be followed through the whole of northern Gondwana and took place during the late Landovery, early Wenlock. Deltaic progradation continued during the middle to late Silurian. 
Eventually, sea level dropped significantly, and fluvial sands of the Tetrarch formation were deposited in Libya. The northwestward movement of the Silurian shoreline is believed to have started in southeast Libya and moved gradually into the Murzuk Basin and the northwest Libyan Gadamis Basin. This explains the significantly greater shale thicknesses of up to 700 meters in the distal shellful areas compared to only 100 meters of hemipelagic Tanazov shales in the proximal Kufra Basin. From a sequence stratigraphic perspective, the lower hot shale was deposited during the initial transgression. The contact between the Tanizov shales and the underlying Ordovician represents the transgressive surface. The hot shale and the lower part of the cold shales fall into the transgressive systems tract. The maximum flooding surface falls into the middle Landovery, a time when Akakos sands began to prograde in southeast Libya on the most proximal part of the North African shelf. In the more distal Murzuk Basin, this level lies still well within the clean Tanizov shales because the sands arrived here only later. In the Murzuk Basin, the high stand systems tract is represented by the upper part of the Tanizov and the Akakas formation. The well-bedded progradational sands of the Deltaic Akakas formation form the scenic cliffs of Jebel Akakas along the eastern margin of Wadi Tanazuft. Erosion has cut deep, hanging wadis into the escarpment face. The contact between the Tanazuft shales and the Akakas sandstones is gradational and reflects the gradual sealing of the pro-deltaic muds by the prograding sandy delta front. Massive sandstones in the uppermost part of the escarpment already represent fluvial strata of the early Devonian Tadrat formation. Weathering has sculpted pinnacles overlooking Wadi Tanazuft. The Tadrat marks the end of the sea level cycle that started off with glacial, fluvial and shallow marine deposits of the upper Ordovician. During the early Silurian transgression, the cycle entered into a hemipelagic marine phases. Deltaic progradation marks the slowdown of the sea level rise and the initial sea level fall. The river sediments of the Tadrat lead back to the starting point of this second order eustatic cycle. The Sahara is full of geological and non-geological secrets. Answering an open question immediately raises several new ones. The Gart outcrop belt is the ideal natural laboratory to search for the answers in the past, today and in generations to come. <laughs>